Hello and welcome. I'm Bradley McLean, co-founder of Regulation Asia, and I welcome everyone to today's discussion, signals-based approach to transaction monitoring. Now, bad actors, be they motivated by greed or desperation, the results of their money laundering, it's a serious problem for the global economy. The challenge is, is transaction monitoring is a complex discipline dependent on the processes and filtering of masses of data, and it's constantly evolving with the increasing demands of regulators as well as the bad actors themselves who continue to adapt to these ever-changing methodologies. And this, this is what brings us here today. Fresh off the, the latest guidance on the transaction monitoring from HKMA last week in Hong Kong, we're going to delve into the common challenges associated with traditional AML transaction monitoring and what an alternative, more effective approach might look like. And with that, I welcome our special guest, David Griffiths, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Adventus, who's going to discuss with me a signals-based approach to transaction monitoring and how it may be applied in real-world scenarios to reduce workloads and increase efficiencies. Welcome, David. Hi, good morning. Now, before we jump into the conversation, just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone uh, at home or in the office. We will be taking questions throughout the discussion, so please use the Q&A box throughout to, to give us your questions, and we'll address them when we can throughout the conversation, and then hopefully leave a little bit of time at the end to also go through anything outstanding. Likewise, if you come across any issues with your audio or video along the way, please also let us know in the chat. We do have a support team in the wings ready to jump in uh, when, they have, when you have any issues. Excellent. Now, I guess we can just jump straight into it. I mean, David, I'm keen to get your thoughts and observations on, let's call it the status quo, you know, the traditional transaction monitoring systems. You know, obviously the, the investment into these types of platforms, it's significant. So from your perspective, how effective are they in identifying and intercepting financial crime? And where, at least from your perspective, do you see the bottlenecks? That's a good question. Um, and I know we've only got about 30 to 45 minutes today, so I'll do my best to, uh, to I guess, hit the salient points. Um, I mean, obviously, first of all, thank you for um, uh, having this session. I think it's going to be a really good um, interest and insight um, for many of the participants who've been in the industry for, for many, many years. I um, want to be able to um, later on give a uh, a kind of a new paradigm, slightly different way of being able to to help manage uh, these pain points. Um, obviously, the the key pain point that tends to come up first and foremost are uh, the ability to deal with false positives. Um, there's a lot um, of different ways to be able to manage that today. But then I'm also conscious that the different types of businesses, the different types of banks and activities. Uh, will allow us to range from things as you know as um, uh, rudimentary as spreadsheets with BI tools, all the way up to the most sophisticated um, transaction monitoring systems. Um, to me, one of the other aspects is the manpower, the human capital investment that's needed um, to be able to manage the end-to-end -end process. Um, just even within transaction monitoring, you know, not 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 counting um, what's involved for KYC. And so, yeah, that, that significant, um, what I call tier one triage, um, obviously has a huge impact on both human capital operations as well as the ultimate cost of, um, of regulatory compliance. So the pain points as you see it today are the tier one. I mean, you and I have been around for a while. I mean, and you're a very uniquely positioned given your role across the region, understanding how different firms are approaching this. But we have been talking about a lot of these issues for a long time. In fact, if I take a, a bit of a time travel back a decade ago, we would have been talking about similar issues. But the, the level of activity in financial crime compliance obviously has expanded significant, uh, significantly over the past decade. But we're still talking about high false positives. So, David, I mean, I guess a simple question to start off with, why do the volumes of false positives, why are they still so high? Is it just this tier one uh, challenge that you've mentioned? I think it's the complexity of, of businesses. And um, I mean, to a certain degree, some of it relates to how decisions are made around the transaction monitoring platforms, uh, whether that is um, a head office mandate to be able to um, uh, push out a platform across different regions, sometimes globally, sometimes different countries within Asia. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily negative, but because of the, the differences in business, the difference in client, and, and to me, most importantly, the difference in the data that exists within all of the different platforms, um, be it for banking, be it KYC platforms, 
that in itself has just simply grown, I think, as a result of just consumer appetite for, I um, mean, obviously recently in the, the past kind of two to three years with the introduction of, of crypto, for example, um, the fact that folks are now getting into, uh, they're doing more deposits. Obviously, COVID had a, um, a significant impact on people being able to use cold cash, right? Ele- electronic transfers, um, you know, the e-commerce business just left off. And so that then obviously naturally caused a huge amount of um, spike within electronic payments. And so I think it's just the nature of the dynamics that have existed across the world um, over the past decade. But then I think it's also um, the just the different approaches that um, when I was working at institutions and also prospects of ours are dealing with different technology. Um, you know, some firms have gone to look and delve into the AI machine learning aspect. Others would delve into robotic process automation. Others would focus on being able to do more pattern and practice type activity. Model validation teams have started to come in. So I think it's, um, uh, it's just the way the world has evolved. And, and obviously the world took a bit of a break for two, three years because of COVID and, and obviously the challenges of folks being able to deal with working from home and, and various, various locations. I like that. I'm not sure if we took a break for two or three years, but you're right. The world has been in flux, I guess, over the last couple of years. But, I mean, breaking that down a little bit, you mentioned the business type is obviously a key driver, whether it's crypto, payments, or whatever whatever institution you're looking at. There's something about AI I'd like to put a pin in and come back to. But as a starting point, you know, from your perspective, what does good look like when it comes to remediating false positives? And from your perspective, is the current approach working or should we be looking at alternatives? Um, it's a really, I said, you know, what does good look like? Um, uh, good looks like um, what uh, senior management view as being good, what, you know, local regulators view as being good. I think that there's many kind of different ways to, to define what that means. But one of the things that um, uh, I tend to, to, to gravitate towards is good to me is when you're able to address the local business risks, when you're able to be able to identify based on the different client personas that you have, the different products. Um, obviously, when we're going to you know talk a little bit about capital markets, for example, the different asset classes that are being traded. I referred to crypto as well earlier. Being able to associate the behaviors that you need to monitor, the typologies that have existed for many years against the specific business risk is what, as, is what I would define as, as, as being good. Okay. I mean, how about the current approaches? I mean, are they working or are you looking at alternatives? Uh, yeah, they, they do work. Um, I mean, we see that. Uh, we do see enforcements all around the world in terms of, of various um, aspects, various crime rings, et cetera, being brought down. We had one recently here in Australia. Um, and of course, crypto was mentioned as one of the methods that was being used within, within that scheme. Um, I believe that one of, the, um, you know, one of the, the key pain points that we tend to, to, to try and address is the concept of parameterization. Um, it's fairly common and has been, um, in my experience for two decades now, where the typologies, the names, the types of risks um, that you're looking to address, they haven't changed. And so that procedure based um, does exist, will continue to exist. Um, it's really more to do with how you can address the different um, aspects of the business, the different workflows of the business, trying to get into the profiling of the different personas I think it, I think it's just a case of choosing the right type of technology for the right type of mix to be able to do this. And I mean, a good example of that is for name screening. I mean, to be able to implement AI machine learning for name screening is a very, very good approach because um, obviously we've been using fuzzy matching for many, many years, but also AI ML can have um, an impact on operational cost in other areas because of the need to be able to, to train models in the supervised learning model uh, case, for example. So there's lots of different ways. And um, I tend to, tend to look at this, uh, the analogy I tend to use, 
have used in both AML and also in capital markets trade surveillance is that kind of game of pin the tail on the donkey where, but you don't have the blindfold where you're identifying the different aspects of what you want to be able to do. You're taking your pin and you're saying, that's what I want to be able to do in that specific instance, which to me is the complete opposite of the kind of pinata um, uh, use case where you've got the blindfold and you're kind of swinging wildly and you hope that something will break through and come through. So, Lots of different ways, but I think it's the um, being specific around the business risk and then choosing the right type of um, technology or approach to be able to address it. Okay, so we're linking specific risks with the associated behaviours and those uh, underlying risks associated with those behaviours. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by a signals-based approach? Yeah, so... I mean, signals have existed for many, many years, um, obviously in the trading world. I'm not necessarily going to focus on trading because, um, you know, it's that's just a uh, focus on capital markets. But the concept today is where an action gets performed, something is executed off the back of one or multiple signals. I mean, we have algos in the trading world today that look at so many different data inputs to decide when to trade. Um, and what we're doing with uh, looking at this signals-based approach is rather than looking at each typology, so rapid movement of funds is one example, as something that needs to generate an alert, we're looking at rapid movement of funds being a signal. And what you're able to then do is take that signal and you can you know, have it generate alerts on its own or be able to combine it with other signals which are relevant to that type of business and so you will have typologies um, you take retail banking for example you have cash deposit type um, typologies that will come into that when it comes to capital markets aml the typologies you're looking at are things such as um, uh, rapid movements of funds without any corresponding trading activity somebody trying to wash the money through a brokerage account, for example, by not trading. And so for us to be able to take that step back and say, rather than go and generate 10,000 alerts, take those alerts and then start working them to try and find something that matches your risk, we're saying we need to identify the different signals that are associated with a business risk. And you can then combine that into one or multiple different alert typologies which in itself will naturally reduce the amount of initial alerts that you get. It also gives you, a, we believe, a higher level of context because you're able to, again, associate that alert to the specific transactions and the business risk that you've got. So there's you know, a lot of upsell to that approach, being able to not only assist with the tier one triage, being able to make them a bit more uh, efficient, giving higher quality alerts. But then further down the line, it can also dramatically increase the effectiveness of any type of AI machine learning that you then want to be able to apply on top of these high quality results. So it sounds like the focus is, is essentially the, taking the a position of redefining risk for, for, for institutions. I mean, Gideon, you've mentioned AI and machine learning a few times. I mean, what is the role of AI machine learning? It is, an, is it an essential part of this process or is it a nice to have? I mean, where, do the, where does the institution need to start? It's a, it's a very good question because I also feel that there is a certain... Um, I like the word kludginess around what people mean by AI and machine learning, because in different contexts, it can do different things. Um, I mean, we obviously talk a lot and we employ a lot of robotic process automation, which some view as being an early stage of that. Um, AI machine learning, I think, is very useful where you actually have the ability. And I always look at this from a human capital perspective. It's useful in an environment where... Um, you have the team and the capability to be able to train the model. Um, reason I say that is this, is, is this concept of explainability. Um, time and time again, for many, many years, we have regulators talking about explainability when it comes to machine learning AI. So you're not able to be able to run with a black box type mentality. You need to be able to explain it. If you can't explain it, 
then it's going to be a challenge to train it. But then more importantly, it's going to be difficult for you to be able to perform any type of model validation, which obviously is one of the core pillars of, of any AML program. Okay. I mean, yet again, you also mentioned about how the signals based approach, you need to change the way people think about alert management and, and case management. I mean, yet again, as we redefine risk for institutions, how are you seeing that, you know, we're needing to change the way people think about alert and case management? I think for, for many years, and I include myself in, in this population, the standard approach of um, working an alert uh, you then looked for look for potentially linked alerts or related alerts. You then go and investigate those. You choose then to escalate that into a case. Um, then you might then put that to a different unit who are then looking throughout the cases. There's obviously a lot of workflow. Um, we know that there's been a lot of investment and there's a lot of advances in technology around the workflow. The challenge to me that still exists is as good as the platform is, as good as the workflow engine is, it still needs that expertise to be able to determine um, is, is alert number one and alert number three something that I need to link together to promote into a case. Um, more importantly, could alert, five, alert three and alert five be something that I also then want to do, but I maybe not get access to that level of information. And so what... The approach that we that we look to take is to be able to say what are the different business risks that apply for your asset class business product, for example, and let's now go and see which of the different signals will apply to be able to give you that alert that gives you that context for you to be able to maybe no longer say I want to link a little one with alert three because those two behaviors, those two typologies, have been included together in one concise piece of work. Um, to us, that can obviously, as I've mentioned earlier, dramatically reduce the number of alerts, but then it'll also help deliver higher quality context-based um, escalations to, you know, upwards in the chain um, and ultimately, I guess, outwards to um, the FIUs in terms of any SAR reporting. Okay, I mean, let's take a step back. And I mean, based on your, your work in the industry, could you give me a couple of examples of how an institution may define signals and perhaps the outcomes you're seeing? For example, are, are we seeing that, you know, institutions are needing to, to change their processes to meet, meet the, the buckets of, the, of the, the software vendor or should the vendor themselves be defining them based on what the institution is looking for? I believe it's a combination of both in a sense that a vendor needs to be able to have the full range of typologies available for that business, for the client that they're trying to address, or they have the ability to be able to take existing behaviors and make changes, right, uh, to be able to address that. We know that that's something, uh, obviously, we had the recent update from HKMA, and that was one of the aspects that came out in that, where it was talking about the ability to be able to make changes to, to, to fit the business rather than taking that kind of square peg and trying to stick it into the, into the round hole. Um, one of the aspects that, uh, you know, we look at when we come to do the risk mapping, which is typically one of the former steps, formative steps, sorry, is to be able to say, you know, what type of business are you looking at? What is the, the, the type of risk? And, you know, not talking about things like entity risk or necessarily transaction risk, but um, I mean, over the past couple of years, as we've been, um, you know, getting ready to be able to come out and start talking about signals based, been a number of conversations I've been having where, um, you know, clients and prospects have been saying, I would really love it if I could just get an alert that took this and this and this and combined it all into one for me, without me having to go and create a case and do something else. And so, of course, we sometimes turn that conversation on the head and say, right, so can you, do you have the ability to be able to start defining what are those combinations of the traditional age-old typologies that would then allow you to be able to turn that into that meaningful, you know, signal, that meaningful type alert. And so what it's doing is it's, it's changing, we believe, um, a lot of that risk assessment to be upfront. Um, as compared to some circumstances where you put the data into the system, you switch on the parameters, you set the parameters super wide, and then you see what comes out. 
And, you know, oftentimes what you get is a flood of information, then you spend good time understanding. Now, there's nothing wrong necessarily with that approach, apart from the time it takes and apart from the actual volumes that you might be putting in. The larger the institution, the larger the trade flows, obviously then start getting into the concept of sampling. Again, sampling is a very valid technique to use as long as you have processes and procedures wrapped around it. But when we look at signals-based approach, we believe that is something where you can cast the wide net, you can cover every typology, you can cover every type of risk and every transaction that you need to monitor. But what you're doing right from the outset is associating the results directly with a business risk that, that's relevant to the business. Okay, so let's think about that from the capital markets perspective. I mean, how would you a approach applying, you know, a signals-based approach for a capital in the capital markets? And what are some of the typologies you'd be looking to identify? That's a, that's a good question because one of the, um, I guess, another aspect as to for the past couple of years as we've been preparing um, to, to talk about signals-based is obviously dealing with capital markets clients there tends to be, um, I guess, an underserving because of the other aspects of business that that client is involved in to focus on um, AML in relation to the trading activities, the capital markets activities. And so simple things such as wash trading, for example, that's looked as a, a way of dealing with money pass, um, you know, where there's a transfer of securities or as we saw recently in, in Australia, transfer of crypto, for example. Um, other aspects, um, is classic examples, is where, as I mentioned earlier, money is being washed through the brokerage's accounts, but the money in and out doesn't seem to tally in with any kind of related trading activity. That trading activity in itself also um, talks to you know, aspects of KYC where you're trying to understand the type of, of profile, trading pro profile that that client's going to do. And for many years, there's always been the concept, um, certain things I've been involved in where um, inquiries out to clients as to how come, you know, there's an increase as compared to what they said was going to come through. And market volatility has been used as an example for it. And so we think very strongly that there is a lot of, uh, information. There's a lot of behavioral analytics that you can get from simply looking at the trade inside will absolutely benefit things such as entity risk um, and all types of risk profiling within that capital markets AML space. Okay. But in terms of redefining risk signals for the capital markets, would these commonly include fraud related indicators or do you see uh, fraud risk detection as something separate? It's a, it's a good question. I think, again, it's one of the things where what people define in as, as fraud. Um, we've seen cases recently here in Asia where um, you've had account takeover is one of those classic examples. Um, or when I say account takeover, it's somebody has a controlling interest over an account that's not necessarily theirs. And we've seen a number of um, uh what we call market abuse type violations that have come off the back of that. But when then when you look at the actual um, uh, legal um, filings that have been made against those perpetrators, you, you always see money laundering sitting in there as, as you know, being able to, to deal with the proceeds of crime. And so, yeah, there's many different ways for you to be able to, to, to look at the fraud aspect. Definitely within the crypto space, um, fraud is one of the, the, the big aspects that comes, comes into mind especially when we talk about on-chain type activity. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when you look at it from a, a money laundering perspective, it's always going to be that conversion from crypto into fiat and the off-ramp, or whether it's somebody who's transacting within the financial markets, uh, using that transfer of security as the way to be able to, um, to pass over collateral rather than using cash. And then it's the ultimate cash out that people are looking at. I mean, I'm, I will always defer to any legal minds to then say whether it's, you know, considered financial crime versus the true financial crime versus fraud. Um, again, it's, it's, it's something that I think there's many signals you can do to generate to be able to help you get to that point. As we start to look to implement capital markets types of programs, for you, where is the starting point? 
I believe it comes from, I mean, to me, it comes from two aspects. One is, um, again, the type of, the type of business. I mean, if you're a prop trading firm, then um, that's something where with the absence of customers, um, it's a challenge when you look at hedge funds, for example, which some folks say are kind of prop trading related. Again, to me, it's, it's one of the cases as to whether there is a customer element from a transaction perspective. Definitely KYC fits into that space. Um, for us, it ranges anything from the typical broker-dealer space. Um, obviously, we're looking at wholesale bank activity, the regional banks that we have in, in the, um, uh, within Asia-Pacific, uh, broker-dealers or you know, that kind of classic securities brokerage that happens. Um, and of course, we have crypto now that's popped up. So, um, you know, even though that uh, crypto is not necessarily defined as necessarily as capital markets, in terms of the AML risks that sit over the top of it, they are identical because it all ties around that trade in space and the activity the clients are legitimately doing versus those who use that trade in space to be able to um, uh, get away with their money laundering activities. I mean, yet again, you've mentioned crypto a few times. and I, I must admit, it's been a hot topic for a number of years. But are you seeing any linkage between, I guess, crypto, tr uh, traditional markets and new markets to watch money? I mean, like a resurgence, for example, between the linkage between crypto and traditional financial markets? Absolutely, yes. Um, obviously, with you have dedicated crypto firms that exist today, you know, uh, what we call inter the intermediaries, the brokers. But then, obviously, we're seeing a significant uptake in traditional uh, brokerage houses wanting to be able to go into the crypto market to be able to do it. So, for us, we view that as an additional asset class. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of information where you know folks talk about what happens on chain. We're not talking about the situation where somebody has you know, crypto taken from their wallet, that is something. And there's solutions, some really good solutions out there that take care of that. But in terms of the usage of crypto, to be able to um, uh, send money from one location to the other, um, to us, that's no different as to how we would handle traditional, you know, equities versus fixed income versus futures from an asset class perspective. I mean, it's interesting that we, we kind of focused on the, the capital markets discussion. I mean, yeah, they, they, they're characterized by a combination of what? Large volumes of transactions running through global securities hubs. They've got multiple clients across many institutions, cross-border activity, electrating venues. It, it seems like it's a perfect storm for, for bad actors to obscure illicit you know, transactions and movement of funds. But please correct me if I'm wrong. Historically, money laundering in capital markets has not been a huge focus for banks. So with that in mind, I guess... Given the, the high risks associated with this, why aren't capital markets of greater focus for, I guess, either financial institutions or regulators? One of the aspects that always comes in is, um, and it's something we talked about right at the start, is just around the data, both data quality as well as the data mapping. And again, those are the two of the aspects that um, have come out in that, the recent um, HKMA update. And... Obviously, one of the challenges that exists today in the capital market space is being able to associate something as simple as a trading account right down to the account that's used from a settlement perspective. Um, you know, even from a custody point of view, uh, where, where uh, you know, people may be holding securities or they're holding crypto, for example, being able to ensure that you have the lineage right from the front office trade and activity right through to the um, the back office activity, which is one of the mainstays of the transactions that are used for AML. Um, that mapping is, is 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 very intricate, and it's something I think that it is always going to challenge. Now, in certain areas, um, it can be argued that there's less links in the chain, which make it a little bit easier. Um, but again, to me, the challenge has always been, and coming back to one of your earlier questions, which is where do you start? In addition to understanding the business risk, in addition to understanding the AML risk that you have associated with it, it's also understanding um, maybe the spider's web of, of platforms that sit within the mix. And to make sure that you're pulling the right data from the right place, that does sound simple when you say it that way. That's obviously a reason why within the AML space, it does take time to be able to cover all areas. It does take time to focus on specific areas. But I think in my perspective, when it comes to capital markets AML, one of the big challenges is mapping front office 
um, identifiers right all the way back to the back office identifiers. It's interesting you mention that. And one of the questions from the audience goes down to one of those fundamental questions, how to set the thresholds for alerts. Obviously, it's based on the business activities that you've identified at the very start. But yet again, from your perspective, as, as firms are looking to redefine risk to implement new si uh, signals-based approach, how do you approach the, the issues of thresholds and alerts? Okay. Uh, again, good question. Obviously, at some point, somebody makes, needs to make the call, whether it be by asset class or location or client, as to what that benchmark threshold needs to be. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about robotic, a robotic process automation, which is one technique where you're able to come in on top of the parameters that you've set in order for you to be able to say, I want to now be able to apply an extra layer of business logic. So today, rather than having to worry about, does your vendor give me the 27 different parameters in this behavior, what we're saying is you need to be able to split those things out. You have your standard typology, which has all its regular parameters. That helps with consistency, especially in, especially in regional global organizations, for you to be able to treat the typologies the same. But then you take robotic process auto automation and start applying those local rules over the top of it, which then refine the alerts. The other aspect of being able to use something like um, uh, I'll call it RPA, robotic process automation. One of the good things with RPA is it then allows you to be able to put in place, um, some people call it pattern and practice, others call it below the line, above the line um, testing. It allows you to be able to move into that space where you're able to take your alerts. You don't close them. You never close the alerts down. You will acknowledge the alerts to show that they exist. But in terms of the type of analysis, it's a case of doing trend analysis, looking at your below the line, looking at your above the line. Again, to me, this speaks to one of those standard pillars around the AML testing that needs to happen, and as well as the policies and procedures that you need to have in place for things like model validation. So lots of different, um, uh, different aspects. But ultimately, it does come down to the qualified professionals that will exist in jurisdiction, in location, that need to be able to take that initial first step and say, this is the parameter that I want to set. Now, please help me figure out what am I missing, but then what also the things that I don't necessarily need to worry about today on a daily basis or a weekly basis. What are those behaviors that I can actually look at from a trend perspective? And to me, it's about being able to have the tools and the techniques. And again, the different technology for the different purposes to be able to, to get you to that point of having higher quality referrals, escalations, and ultimately the SARS that get filed. No, no, it, may, it makes sense. And especially get, given the maturity of the organization, different firms will be facing different challenges at different points. But yet again, based on your experience, what would be the most common combination of scenarios in a signals-based approach? And how does this differ across business types, as you'd mentioned? It's one question that's really difficult to answer because there is no common type when it comes to signals. Um, obviously, one of the, the more common uh, elements that we have, and in, in some cases, some folks have equated this to the stop the algo concept that exists, is um, I want to be able to generate an alert when I suddenly see activity in the account that has remained dormant or has low trade in volume. Suddenly there's a spurt in trade in activity, which gives an indication of something. And that's where the wash trade in will come into it from a trade surveillance perspective. But then show me where there might be a period of more funds coming in and out for which there is no corresponding trade in activity. And again, when if you're looking at things that say a dollar value, what you might be missing is activity in instrument A is trying to cover over the fact that you're not doing something else in another instrument. And of course, the natural response when getting questioned is it's all related to trade and activity. We understand that. And so some of this is actually going a little bit more granular than looking at things that just simply currency values. It's actually the makeup of what the currency is. What are the assets that are being traded? Those are the typical type of scenarios and problems that we, um, you know, we've been asked um, about over the past couple of years. I think the next question may be very similar. There's no right answer or how long is a piece of string. But when, it, when we look at false positives, especially if we're looking to benchmark, from your perspective, you know, what is the appropriate false positive rates when we're looking at capital markets type surveillance? And then yet again, 
how it, what is the process for mitigating or managing these types of uh, alerts? I'll take the second question first. Again, in, in order to be able to mitigate, I'm not trying to avoid that, but um, I'm sure there'll be some reactions. But um, it's, it's, as I said a, a few minutes ago, the way to be able to manage and mitigate, um, and again, when we're looking at things like regulatory compliance, it's been able to demonstrate that you have that comprehensive AML program in place. So again, it's coming back to the above the line, the below the line testing. It's making sure that you understand the models that you're that you're employing if you do choose to employ AI, ai machine learning you have to ensure that there's explainability right so a lot of this is about you being able to demonstrate that you have the right controls in place now the first question as to what's uh, um, an acceptable false positive if i gave that number today it'd probably go viral um, but again it's one of those things where it's about acceptable risk there is no number as to what is an acceptable amount of, of, um, of false positives. Um, in terms of how we would look to approach that, uh, again, it's is there an acceptable level that you can define once you've employed things like RPA, once you've employed things like machine learning, as compared to just getting a very generic, I've had 10,000 alerts today, out of those, I believe 9,000 are false positives. Well, if that's the case, you do have to do that hard graft of going in and trying to be able to explain why that's happening. Because when you start going in and saying, right, I'm now able to explain 8,500 of these away for these various reasons, that can either turn into something that's a parameter, but again, you could argue in most cases, the, the actual alert itself doesn't have the parameter. For us, that's when RPA comes in because you can apply those multi-layered business logic uh, rules against those alerts to then ensure that you're not getting so many false positives. So I'm not going to give you a number today, but I can definitely give you an approach for it. I think that I know the answer to the next question, and it might be the same answer. I'm not going to give you a number, but one of the questions here is taking it one step forward, looking at the ratio between alerts to SARS or STRs or whatever, you know, FIU type reporting. Uh, do you have, you know, expectations of what is what we should be expecting? when we're benchmarking our operations? I see a, a separation in that aspect because again, um, I mean, from, from my perspective, and again, when you look at it from a vendor perspective, that conversion of what is, is an actionable SAR, those are the kind of numbers that we tend not to get involved in. But I think from uh, what we have experienced, um, again, we've, we've been in transaction monitoring space for, for a number of years in addition to obviously coming out and starting to talk about signals-based approach. But one of the things that we tend to look at in that conversion is the actual context. Um, is that SAR a component of a different, a certain type of topologies? How far have you taken your case in order to be able to decide at which point? There's too many differences, too many variables, I think, across different locations for you to be able to say, this is, I think, an effective conversion rate is, unfortunately. We've spent a lot of time today talking about the capital markets, but when we look to the longer term, I mean, do you think, is this the spot where you believe, you know, the regulators will be focusing over the next 12, 18, 24 months? Or are, are there other areas on the horizon that have you concerned as well? I think AML is going to, obviously it's going to exist across um, many areas. I think the reason why we're looking at um, capital markets AML today is, just an increase. Um, the access that the people have had in the past few years, the increase in consumer trading in the market, um, potentially as a direct result of, of COVID, is, has, has obviously grown significantly. That has obviously, as you mentioned quite rightly earlier, has allowed a lot of bad actors to then suddenly come into the market it means that there's a valid reason for somebody to now try and open a brokerage account where previously they haven't. So yes, yeah, so there's a lot of focus, I think, simply because of ease of access and, and how easy it is now to trade. Um, the other part as well um, is obviously in the digital asset space when talked about crypto, where there's obviously been a lot of cases in, in um, highlighted over the past few years about the type of fraud um, or the type of activities where crypto is used 
um, within the money laundering space. So, you know, we're obviously, um, uh, you know, heavily invested in within the capital market space due to the nature of who we are. But again, that is going to, you know, translate across to all kinds of different aspects. I mean, we've not we've not got time to even talk about KYC today. We've talked, fo- so, you know, focused on transaction monitoring. One of the big aspects with all of what we've talked about today for transaction monitoring is then looking at the feedback loop that needs to exist back into the KYC process, as well as that feedback loop that needs to go into the AML training and also into the risk assessments that happen. So um, to me, it, it's um, you know, an activity that happens in capital markets is obviously going to um, create an impact in correspondent banking, for example. And so the two are in, in, you know, linked together. Um, but again, I think it's just because of what's happened over the past few years, that trading area has opened up to more people, which is why there's a natural lens looking at it. I mean, linked, I think, is the key term there. I mean, we talked about behaviors and, and the risky type, uh, the risk types as well. But obviously, there's a lot of moving parts there. I mean, can you walk us through maybe some of the roadmap you have for Validus AML and how a lot of these moving parts are helping to find the, the roadmap for this part of the world? Yeah, I actually look at it from an evolution of um, what I call the evolution of deployment, right? And so when, some, when, when, when a bank wants to be able to come and implement the platform, um, either because it's the first time they're doing it, they're upgrading from their spreadsheets and BI tools, or they want to be able to move off their existing vendor for various reasons. Um, and to me, some of the very clear cut examples that we have is the data management piece is very key. So there's a significant amount of activity in that spot um, to be able to make sure that you have the flexibility to be able to deal with all of the different data attributes that you get. I referred earlier as to the simple but challenging mapping that exists between front office and back office. So having the ability to be able to deal with that is a key part. And data obviously is the first thing that you look at. Um, To me, the second part is the advancement around the risk profiles. The risk profiles relevant to the risk of the business that feeds the transaction monitoring from an entity risk or a transaction risk being able to define um, the client's activity profile, for example, um, you know, that's obviously something that's a very strong part. That to me comes in uh, once you've got your basics of data and transactions flowing into the system, especially in an environment where you're looking at trends and profiles and changes in behavior that exist over six months, nine months, 12 months, and even longer. Um, I always tend to put a kind of AI machine learning towards the end of that, because again, with, you know, we talked about having good profiling data, a good client activity profile, um, something that can take easily six months to be able to mature. Once you have that mature data layer, that to me is the time when you want to start bringing in machine learning because you don't necessarily want to, you know, teach it on brand new data. You want to be able to, to bring it in on seasoned data. And so being able to go through that evolution of, do I understand my customer, my business risk? Do I understand my data? Once you've got those three components together, that's when you can then start getting a little bit funky using AI, using machine learning, being able to go and implement the robotic process automation to reduce false positives. And to me, that, as I said, that deployment um, aspect, again, is something that runs in line with um, some of the features that we're obviously going to be um, uh, releasing over the course of this year. So yet again, in terms of the AI machine learning, you're saying that in terms of the deployment, it, it's not something where we start, right? It, it's actually kind of where we end once we're more mature in the operations. The starting point is nice to have, but it's essential towards the end, end of the process. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you were to start off with the uh, uh, machine learning, you're effectively starting off with a black box. It's something that somebody else has created, which may not be a fit to your business. Um, and obviously, sometimes it's very easy to run ahead of yourself and say, I've got less alerts because machine learning is telling me not to worry about these. If you validated the model, that's fine. Um, now, obviously, when we look at the trading space, you can do that model validation with a week's worth of trading data. But because of the nature of AML, and the nature of um, uh, the transactions involved, you're looking at a data set which is much, much larger. There's obviously that condition. Um, I've been through it myself a few times where you want to be able to backload maybe 18 months worth of data into the platform. But then, you know, I always tend to ask the 
question, is that good data? Is that data that's come from another platform? You know, there's lots of different ways around it. But to me, to be able to start immediately with the machine learning um, is probably not the best approach because it's a generic model that you need to be able to build up over time. You need it running over seasoned, qualified data first. Seasoned and qualified. I mean, yet again, I'm keen to get your thoughts, you know, to look into the crystal ball. Given today's discussion and the focus on capital markets, do you expect there will be an increasing enforcement in capital markets uh, and uh, capital markets trade abuse? And I guess so. If so, which particular regulators or jurisdictions do you think that this is going to be a, a focus? Well, I'm in Sydney today, so I obviously and I'm going to Singapore tomorrow, so I'm not necessarily going to call out specific countries and say these are the ones. We absolutely across um, Asia and the key locations, we always see you know, well publicized enforcement actions that are taken. Um, I think to us, the challenge really is what makes the headline in the press is is making us aware. There's so much detail that's out there. Um, I don't think any particular region is necessary necessarily going to um, be strong and like kind of be top of the list, for example. Um, we're obviously starting to see a lot of cases related to money laundering. As I mentioned, there was one uh, um, a few weeks ago in Australia, which mentioned crypto. Um, and again, as we were talking through some of these things in terms of our side, the question is, well, you know, maybe there's other things that are happening, which is using equities, for example, but it just turns out that unfortunately, it's not something that we're made aware of, right? And so to me, that's why, you know, whether it's crypto, whether it's um, equities, for example, I don't really see there's going to be um, any difference, any change. Um, I think it's more a case of that, uh, you know, crypto is seen as something that's new, and therefore, huh, maybe it's easier to do something when, in fact, we're seeing, you know, the opposite being the case simply because of, you know, we have KYC requirements. Um, you know, all of the venues have those regulations to be able to make sure that they're registered for um, the various jurisdictions. So um, I don't, I'm not going to pick necessarily a favorite. Um, I think we're going to start seeing, you know, more and more of these things coming out as the awareness starts to grow. So it's a burning fuse. There will be awareness, but it won't be the number top one priority next year, but it will be an increasing focus in incoming years. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, with that, we're out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. We invite listeners to email us any additional questions and visit www.regulationasia.com to keep a track of this space. Uh, thank you so much to our special guest today, David Griffiths, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Adventus, for his insightful discussion. Uh, likewise, I'd like to thank everyone who dialed in to join today's discussion. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time. The recording of the session will be emailed out shortly so everyone can sit there and, you know, uh, listen to and come back with a few more questions along the way. We look forward to speaking with everyone again very, very soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.